Great, welcome to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs on this lovely Wednesday, February 22nd. For the second half of our morning here, we're gonna be renewing our conversation about our draft elections bill. And uh, John Rogers is here, former Senator, and welcome to the House GovOps Committee. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Committee, for giving me a little time to speak on this. It's, it's actually a subject that uh, former Senator White and myself uh, spoke about several times, and we're planning on getting to uh, at some point, but neither of us are there anymore, and so I was quite pleased to see that your committee was taking it up. It's been my perspective for a long time that uh, one person, one vote, and one candidate, one party. Um, and personally, even beyond what's, what's in your bill, uh, I think we have a serious problem with primary elections because even in a good year like last year, 27% of the electorate came out in the primary. And by having these hybrid candidates that are representing two different party, it skews the results even further. Um, it, if the progressives want to be a party, then I think if you're a progressive, you should run as a progressive and not as a Democrat. And so, I mean, no disrespect to any candidates, but I'd like to use a couple of the uh, elections as an example. Um, and Dave Zuckerman's a friend of mine. I've worked with him for years from the time I was elected into the House back in 2003. Uh, but the fact that he continues to run as a DP, <clears throat> I don't believe there's any th such thing as a Democratic progressive. You're either a Democrat or a progressive. You wouldn't consider yourself to be a Democratic Republican or a Republican progressive. And I believe the race would have gone much different if Dave would have run as a progressive. Uh, it would have been a, a three-way race in the general. But what happened, because Dave got the nomination, other people who've run as Democrats their whole life got beat because the progressives are voting in the Democratic ele election, in the Democratic primary. Um, and it's my perspective, and I don't know how to solve it, but maybe this committee does, um, I think the primaries as we run them in this state and in the nation are part of what is causing uh, the conflict mostly in, in Washington, more so than here in the State House. But out of that 27%, which is higher than it is very often, you're getting your most partisan people. You're getting the, the folks on the left and the folks on the right. And that's why we're seeing many of these primary elections um, Moderates can't make it through. Moderates who would beat the candidate that beat them if it went to a general election. And I would go back to the lieutenant governor's race. I believe if Kitty Toll and Dave Zuckerman were running in the general election, I believe Kitty Toll would have beat him. I believe in the race for Congress. If Becca Ballant and Molly Gray ran against each other in the general election, I believe Molly Gray would have won. That's just my perspective. I mean, you could, you could ask political scientists who study this more. Um, but what's happening in our elections is it's not just Democrats voting in the Democratic primary. And I think your bill addresses this by making people pick a party. You're either one or the other. Uh, I was listening to a VPR broadcast, and they were interviewing the leader of the Vermont Progressive Party. And he said that some 20 of their folks, progressives, were running as Democrats for the legislature. Um, so is there a progressive party or is there not? So I'm very thankful that you're talking about this issue and I, I really hope you're able to advance it. Um, another thing that I believe in strongly is that independents should be able to file after the primary. In a case like this year's uh, election, a uh, primary election, um, you know, maybe, and of course Kitty Toll didn't do it, and I don't think you're able to do it now, but it would have given her or another person the opportunity to run for the lieutenant governor's position because maybe they supported Kitty and they weren't happy with the choices of, of Joe Benning and Dave Zuckerman. And I think it's, it's super important for people to have choice and if nobody makes it through the primary who they can support, 
then there is still an opportunity to be independent. And so I would hope that independents aren't held to um, having to file previous to the primary, uh, because I think that's one of the reasons to be an independent is that you can step into the race at any point if the candidates are not satisfactory to you and, and, a, and a group of Vermonters. Um, yeah, I guess I guess that really covers the, my main concerns are the the independents being able to get in the race at any point and and making candidates pick uh, the party that they're going to run with and, and run in that primary. And uh, I think those are my those were my two main concerns. Well, we thank you so much for being here. We've heard a variety of perspectives. I'm sure you watched some of the testimony we took on this last week and um, and it really runs the gamut, and it's great to have a, a I think you bring a different perspective than some of the ones we've heard, so I appreciate that. So I have Representative Hooper, and then Representative Hooper. <laughs> <laughs> Senator, welcome. Thank you. Um, don't you think we would sooner get rid of the primary process than allow independents to lose and then run nonetheless? I mean, wouldn't it defeat the point? Well, and that's been an, that has been an argument, the second bite at the apple, so to speak. Um, but are we in the business of uh, restricting candidates, or do we want people to have uh, a choice? And from my perspective, a progressive won our Democratic race for lieutenant governor. Um, and as I said, Dave's a friend of mine, but he's a progressive. He's always been a progressive. He's not a Democrat. And so why, why should we allow him to move forward as a Democrat without the opportunity for at least one, uh, somebody that is a real Democrat to be able to run as an independent? That's, that's my perspective, the way the system is set up right now. And even if we change the system and you only uh, ran on one, like last year, I think there were four candidates for lieutenant governor. And say uh, your candidate didn't make it through and you weren't happy. Uh, with who was left there um, for the general election, I still think that it's, uh, it, and, it, and we all know it's extremely hard for an independent to win in Vermont, the, you know, um, but I think it's still important if somebody has something to say that the other candidates aren't going to bring up that the independents are allowed to run uh, after the primary, after they know who's going forward for the major parties. Representative Hooper, and I think. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative. Everybody here has heard this story, but I'll tell you the story for your folklore collection. <laughs> um, on election day, two JPs go out to a man's house who uh, recently had his leg cut off, and uh, he was concerned with that rather than the election. And uh, when, we, when we got there and asked him which ballot he wanted, he wanted a progressive ballot. He'd been progressive for a long time. He looked at the ballot, turned it over a couple of times, said, I don't recognize anybody on this ballot. He said, oh, you want the Democrats' ballot. Why would I want that? It's where all your candidates are. Um, so it's confusing to the electorate also. It is confusing, yes. And I would say on that same point, there I've heard talk of uh, ranked choice voting, which I think is extremely confusing. And it is not as cut and dried as ranked choice supporters say it is. Because say my first choice doesn't win and the election moves on to the second choice and somebody I really don't like ends up winning, well maybe my fifth choice would have been my second choice if, if I knew that other person was going to win. I, I, I stand by one person, one vote. I, as you said, they don't under, most people don't understand. Those of us who work in this building for years kind of uh, build a knowledge of the science of voting, but most people don't understand, and quite frankly, um, the in in some races, the Democratic primary is the general election. I mean, basically, we've seen that in a, a bunch of races recently, and unfortunately, 27 percent is a high percentage for a primary election, and it's it's despicable that that less than a third of the electorate gets to pick. And, and, you know, it's unfortunate. I don't know how you convince more people 
of the um, importance of the primary election, but we haven't been able to do it. In some years, you know, the results, I think the, the, the turnout's down in the teens, which is really horrible. And so is it really giving us a, a slate of candidates that the general electorate really wants? And I think often it doesn't. And I think the primary system is part of what is leading to extremes, as I said, more in, in national politics than in statewide. But in statewide politics, there are, are certain pockets that are progressive or conservative. And all too often, the moderate gets taken out by a small percentage of the electorate in a primary, when that moderate would have likely won if they made it to the general. We have time for just a couple more questions because we have another witness waiting and we've got to get a new draft on the table in order to provide some context for that. So just framing up here. So Representative Higley, you're next. John, thanks for coming down. Uh, you know, I, I agree with you that uh, I think folks ought to be able to run after the primary as an independent. You know, one, one example uh, that I can give for sure, you may remember, you know, this uh, latest uh, Republican primary for the U.S. House. There was an individual that was nominated that uh, uh, the said they wouldn't even caucus with Republicans. Um, there, there was a, maybe you saw uh, some conversation here about the possibility of somehow the party uh, putting out a statement. Well, they, they can do that anyway, I guess. But again, uh, maybe something on the, on the ballot that, um, that they're, they're not supported by the party. Is that anything that you would well, consider. absolutely. If you have a candidate that's not going to support the party, why would the party support them? But I think that's another one of the problems. In one time uh, in, in my uh, Senate race, I actually got the Republican and the Democratic nomination. And selfishly, I took the Republican nomination because I knew it eliminated the possibility of the party um, appointing someone, you know. Um, and I, you know, I. I did it for my own self-preservation. It was the best thing for my chances for the election to not have to run against a Republican. Uh, but in hindsight, I, I, that's one of the reasons I support the one candidate, one party, is because the local party should have the ability to put a candidate forward if no one got nominated for their party and they find a, a viable candidate. If, if I can just comment on that. Uh, that's something else that I've mentioned, and uh, both Mike Marcott and myself, because there was no Democrat running against us, got the RD nomination. Mm -hmm. um, I never gave it a thought other than, uh, I think you would agree with this possibly, that uh, most of the Democrats up our way aren't necessarily involved in the Democratic Party. They just consider themselves Democrats. And I think one of the things that I appreciate about that is maybe the Democrats that did vote for me as Democrats uh, appreciated seeing that there was a certain number of, of Democratic votes that got me on the ballot as a Democrat as well. So, you know, I, I have mixed feelings about yeah. that. As do I, uh, Representative Higley, because uh, you feel, I mean, when you get that many write-in votes, you do feel some, some gratification that, okay, there's a bunch of people who were voting on that other ticket that supported me, and that's one of the reasons I I said, yeah, I'll, I'll take the, the R endorsement, but in hindsight, uh, I, I really feel that the electorate needs as, as much, uh, as deep a field to choose from as, as they possibly can. And by taking those nominations, we are eliminating the possibility of the, of the county party putting together a, a, a slate of their own people. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to represent Byron and then represent Rowicki, and then we've got to move on. You brought some great things to the table, <laughs> John. Thank you. I, I think I have a quick question for you, but I just wanted to ask you this. I've asked other witnesses this question, but I want to tap it into your years and decades of experience in this elections world and service. Are you are you aware of or how many or any hybrid candidates who are PRs or RPs? <laughs> no, that's one that I. That's one that we haven't seen. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Representative Merwicki. Um, 
thank you, John, for coming. But I did want to just offer Mark the, the reminder that Democrats are holding a place in our caucus for you. John being in the house, you know, uh, it's refreshing to hear, you know, we're never at odds to figure out what you think about something. <laughs> That's true. Um, the question of party registration keeps coming up. Mm. What do you think about that? I've never been a fan of, of party registration because there again, that eliminates the ability for independents and people who don't declare a party to vote in an in a electorate. And I think it's our responsibility to try to get as many people as possible to the polls. And I'm so frustrated, as I've mentioned, with the low turnout that we get in primaries. And so I think uh, party registration flies in the face of one person, one vote. Every person should get a vote in the, in the primary, no matter what their party affiliation is. Yeah. And, and just for the record, our town was over 50% in the last primary. But that's still not That's great, really, for a primary. And right, it's still not enough. It's still yep. not good. Yep. Yep. All right. John, thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, and I know, so uh, committee, the way I would like to uh, use uh, our time this morning uh, is that I'd like to um, invite um, Will Senning from the Elections Division to um, introduce the idea to us of um, the electronic return of, of ballots. And then I'd like to let Mr. Carlin Smith, who's uh, joining us remotely, talk about that particular aspect. And then I'll have Legislative Council walk us through uh, the new draft 2.7 that includes both that new language about ballot returns uh, and the proposal that I um, would like to make uh, as a potential compromise on the fusion candidates issue. So that's just the order of operations. So I'd like to invite Will to take the seat if you're uh, ready to tee up the conversation about um, ballot returns. Happy to, Chair McCarthy. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> I don't have, because we're still, you know, working on various edits to the current draft, I don't have a printed copy in front of me, so excuse my use of my laptop if that's okay. Oh, yeah, please. We're, I'm all about the electronics and issuing paper. Okay. And you want me to start with and focus on electronic return? Yeah, I, I think just so that we can use Mr. Smith's time, I want to just put a, a box around. Let's talk about that first. Sure. Uh, get the committee familiar with that issue, and then we'll open it up and talk about the rest of the changes in the new draft. Great. So thankfully, I prepared some notes specifically on this subject. For you all. <laughs> Great. Something I've worked on for a long time um, during my tenure as the elections director at the Secretary of State's office, which for the record, this is Will Senning, director of elections. Um, when we discuss the issue of electronic return of ballots, I think actually I don't have this in my notes, but I want to make really clear off the, from the top an important distinction between what we're discussing here and the concept of online voting. Um, it's a little hard to distinguish in your head, but, but the nature of when you hear people talk about the concept of online voting, it's, it's casting your votes via the internet or via electronically, um, sort of having, having your ballot go directly from you into the results of the election via the internet, casting your individual votes, making your choices individually via an electronic means. Whereas the, the notion, the concept of electronic ballot return has been around for a long time, um, precedes any of the technology that, that people are referring to when they talk about online voting. Um, and can encompass any range of means of returning a ballot electronically. Um, those have obviously developed over time. 
the first states to allow and implement electronic return of ballots. Um, some of the common ways were by fax machine, for instance. Um, and probably the most common, a PDF attached to an email. So a voter prints, marks a ballot, somehow scans that ballot, creates a PDF of it, and attaches it to an email to send back to their local jurisdiction. Um, as such, right, the, the debate surrounding the electronic return of ballots has always been a weight, a balancing of security, keeping the, the voters' votes secure and free of manipulation, versus uh, increasing voter access, making it easier for people to return their voted ballots to their local jurisdiction, particularly um, military and overseas voters, which I know is a, a, the purview of this committee, and um, voters with disabilities is where it can have the, the most um, significant impact in terms of increasing access. So it's always been a balance between those two things, making sure we can leverage this technology to make it easier and in fact possible for a lot of people to vote um, while trying to make sure we um, protect the security of those ballots that are coming back. That's your basic balance. I would say that for a long time, for years, um, the security arguments were kind of winning the day and um, keeping a lot of this policy from moving forward for, for legitimate reasons, right? To make sure we can get it right and to make sure there's no manipulation of ballots happening as they're coming back. Uh, more and more over the last couple of years, in my experience, the pendulum has been, been swinging the other way toward this being really, again, the only means to facilitate the return of ballots for a pretty significant number of otherwise qualified registered voters who are either um, active duty military even in the states. E easier, I would acknowledge, for those folks to get a ballot back by mail, but military voters who are overseas, US citizens living overseas, and again, voters with disabilities. And really, um, it's that providing an accessible means for an early return of ballots by voters with disabilities that's really swinging the pendulum. Um, there are multiple states, I can provide lists of these if, if the committee so desires, that have already been sued over their inability to provide a sufficient um, accessible means for voters to return, voters with disabilities to return their ballots during the early voting period, uh, including our neighbors. I believe both New Hampshire and Massachusetts have faced such lawsuits. And in response to such lawsuits are either in the process of or already have implemented a system like we're going to talk about for uh, returning early ballots from voters with disabilities and military voters. I think that if we don't take this step, it, it, it is not a... Uh, Just a clarifying question. Go go for it. If we don't take this step, I think we can expect um, either a lawsuit or threat of lawsuit in the not too near future about um, our lack of an option for electronic return for voters with disabilities. What would the mechanics of it be? Well, are we looking at the My Voter page to get to that? Go in and get it and get it right there. Emails from Harvard Free all the time from somebody else. You know. That is what we're, we're, we're looking to go. Um, so just to, to level set, right, to let you know where we are, as, as is the case in many states, right now we allow electronic delivery of these ballots only to a subset, the same subset that we're going to talk about allowing return to. We allowed the delivery electronically to, I have to stop myself every time I say UOCAVA voters because that's the federal law that applies these requirements. Um, UOCAVA voters are military voters and voters, civilians living overseas. So UOCAVA voters and voters with disabilities now can get their ballot delivered electronically. We're talking about also allowing just those same subsets of voters to return it electronically. Um, I, I have in my notes here that the electronic delivery has been a great success. I really can't characterize it any other way. Um, the only reason that I haven't argued to expand it to all voters, which a number of states actually at this point allow, is that it does, at the point we're at with our technology right now, require would require a lot of duplication of ballots that wouldn't be able to be read, read by the tabulators when they come back via this electronic return. I'll get to that in a second also. Um, this language proposes the same subsets of voters to return it. So currently, as I said, you can receive it. And 
you receive it through your My Voter page, as Representative Hooper was referring to. So what's important to note and remember about that page is that you log into that page with some um, personally identifying information. It takes your first name, your last name, of course your town of residence, then either your uh, driver's license number or the last four of your social security number to access your My Voter page in the first place. Started by putting a PDF of the ballot and a printable version of the certificate that needs to go on the envelope with the ballot on the voters my voter page. So they could download that PDF, mark it by hand, download the certificate, sign it, put that certificate on an envelope, put the ballot in it, and mail it back to the clerk. We took another step forward recently by implementing an online ballot marking device. I talked about that a little bit with you guys when we did our run through and I was kind of setting the table for this, right? That is essentially the exact same interface that voters get at the polls with the accessible voting system. But you log into the My Voter page and if, if you've requested your ballot electronically, you get actually an intermediate page before you come to the My Voter page and it says access my ballot or go to My Voter page. If you use the access my ballot, you go to this online ballot marking interface. It's a separate software company that offers it. It's called Democracy Live. I can talk with you guys more about Democracy Live at length or feel, feel free to look them up. Leading provider of this service really around the country. The online interface, you know, it's cool and you can think about it that again, if you've ever gone in, you should, I'd encourage you to at the next election, go ahead and use the accessible voting system at your polling place. Anybody can use it. You go through the screen and you mark your choices like you would mark on a ballot. You say print, and it prints out with the ovals filled in. It inks the ovals right there for you. We spend weeks in our office testing the ballots and making sure it's dropping the ink in the right place on the ovals from what you've marked and that it's well aimed at the ballot itself. So the concept with the online ballot is the same thing. You say access my ballot, you use that option. Again, we have to back end the whole thing so it makes sure to show you the right ballot right out of the 275 ballot styles that I've talked about. You go through on screen, mark that ballot. This is in the early voting context at home, right? You've said, I want my ballot electronically from the clerk. You're sitting at your desk at home. Mark your choices, print it out. Again, package it up. From that interface, we also print the certificate language that you need to put on the outside of the envelope. It takes two envelopes like it would. We don't send you envelopes, obviously, when you're doing electronic delivery. So you gotta find your own envelopes, put the certificate on one of them that has your ballot in it and then put it in a return mailer to go back to the clerk. That's sort of the means that we're talking about, right? So the difference here is you'll follow the same flow. The voter will request it electronically, right, from that those two subsets I talked about. You'd be able to access it and use the ballot marking tool. You'd still be able to go in and do the PDF, print it, mark it, and mail it back if that's what you prefer and it's doable. <laughs> but this option would essentially allow you to do the exact same process, make your choices, and instead of the button saying print, the button says submit to clerk. And the ballot gets delivered back through this portal, does touch the internet at that point, I have to fully acknowledge, right? Um, via the servers that this company administers. The, you will have the ability to, I'm gonna get to, this is the, the lowest level of detail I'll get to you to with about the process. I think what we have to do is have the ability for you to either do the kind of checkbox electronic signature to submit the certificate, or the, the technology is advanced to the point, I really like it, I, I was looking at it about a month ago, that we can also capture a signature the way you do on the keypads these days. The more I thought that through though, right, that is dependent on the device that the person has at the home. If they're working on a laptop like this, it doesn't acknowledge my finger on the screen. And if that's their only option, I think we need to maintain an option to do a checkbox style signature. I'm gonna work on that a little bit more as we go. So that's the basic process. When you think about it, the reason I said that the pendulum is swinging in terms of providing access to voters with disabilities is that that process, the on-screen marking is set up to work with any assistive technology that a person might have at home. So they can do that on-screen marking, for instance, with a sip and buff if they have dexterity issues. Those same kind of, those people with, the, with either some kind of dexterity issues, for lack of a better term, um, voters who are blind or severely limited eyesight, 
of course, then have trouble with the next step of printing the ballot out, putting that certificate on an envelope, folding the ballot, putting it in the envelope, finding the mailer, addressing it to the clerk, and sending it back. That's the rub for the voters with disabilities who really want to be able to conduct this early voting process privately and independently. And that's what those lawsuits have been based around, is that ability to submit the ballot also without showing anybody around you your choices or risking the privacy of your ballot. This would allow for that. As I said, those same assistive devices would allow you to say submit to clerk. The ballot will then come back to the clerk. The clerks all also have a secure login to our system, right? That's where they do all of these election administration functions. And when a clerk logs into our election management system, the first thing they come to is their dashboard, common term, right? And it's got all kinds of daily duties and tasks. It's got their DMV registrations coming over. It's got any online registrations coming in, absentee ballot requests that might have come in for voters for an election. Now there'll be a new category. You've got an electric, electronic ballot returned on the dashboard. Click into that. You might see a little list of voters, two or three, that have returned one this, this way. Click into that voter, print their ballot out on the, the clerk's printer. That's the way that it, it, it um, solves the issue for voters with disabilities. In the same way, your military and overseas <laughs> voters might be on a submarine, might be in all kinds of situations, uh, you know, uh, out in the desert, deployed at the front line, where access to printers is difficult, access to envelopes is difficult, access to postal services is either difficult or non-existent. Um, talking with the, the my contact at Dem Live recently, he told me that he believes they've had a voter submit a ballot back from the space station through this technology, which is kind of cool, for example. I'm getting close. It's important to note that no less than, I think it's more than, the number, I, I hear different numbers from different sources all the time. I should get the definitive one from the group that I trust the most. But no less than 25 states allow for some form of electronic return. So unlike a lot of election reforms that I bring to you guys at this table over the years, we're actually not at the vanguard of this one at the front. Um, it's a very important, I think, um, process to implement, adopt and implement, but um, this is one where we're not at the cutting edge, frankly. It's, it's being done across the country and it's been being done for a long time. The important point is that we've waited for it to get to a place where we know the best, most secure means of doing it, as I've described. Um, that's, I, I come back to the balance that we stated at the beginning, right? If it's, it's imperative to allow these voters a way to exercise their constitutional right to vote. I hear from at least a handful, if not more, military or overseas voters every election who can't get their ballot back on time because of various circumstances and beg me, why can't I just send you a PDF of the ballot attached to an email? It would be so easy. <laughs> I think you could, you could hear testimony from clerks. You should bring Carol in. We were talking about it yesterday. She was telling me stories about voters of hers um, who've asked for this for a long time. I like to say that um, I try to only come to this committee with significant changes like this to the election process where I have heard stories from voters where the need is apparent among the voters in Vermont, right? I wanted to liken it to the example of same-day voter registration. Before you could, you could register to vote up to and including election day, it changed a bunch of times, but the, one, the most recent one before that was five days before the election. And the most difficult calls for me back then when there was a registration deadline the Wednesday before the election were calls from otherwise fully qualified voters between that Wednesday and Tuesday and telling them they couldn't register and participate in the election. Clerks would tell me the same thing, of course, hated those conversations. That led to that really common sense reform that solved that, that problem, eliminated those calls, and it's been a, a great success since then. This is, this, this is the, the voter issue that I hear most about at this point, up to in the days leading up to the election, is how can I get my ballot back up time when I have to mail it, and because of XYZ circumstance, I can't do so. So you're sol solving a real need here. Um, we've heard some advocates come to you even this year talking about certain policies that they consider the next logical step in election reform. 
I won't even address those specifically, but to me, this is the next logical step and most important step in election return that you all can take. Um, I just got back, I was away last week at my National Association of State Election Directors meeting where nearly all 50 of us get together in a room for three or four days. This was and has been over the last two or three years at that meeting a uh, hot topic of conversation about how, how states can move to implement this policy and do it in the right way. And frankly, if we can do this, our portal is going to become a model for other states on um, how to do this um, in a way that works and is as secure as possible. I think every cybersecurity expert, myself included, oh, I'm not a cybersecurity expert, but I also will tell you Nothing is entirely secure. You're always trying to do the best you can to achieve the highest level of security around anything that involves transmission of information over the internet. Okay, so I think uh, we can take some questions and then I'd like to uh, have our guest who's waiting online sort of illustrate some of this for us. So let's ask Will some clarifying questions and then we can come back to Will because I think you're going to stay for the, sure. the whole presentation. If that makes sense. Representative Fitzgerald first. Sure. Thank you, Will. Uh, yeah. One of the uh, questions I've got, I guess, is, um, you know, there has been an issue with mail recently as far as, you know, getting held up and uh, I'm just wondering about uh, the internet as well. I mean, mm -hmm. for both town clerks that may be receiving it and someone overseas that's sending it. Um, any discussion around, um, and again, like I say, there's already an issue with mail, um, but what about the issue of poor internet or no internet, um, last minute, more, more, more so than if you did it two weeks in advance, you may be good to go. If you, know, you understand that there's a problem, you can get at it again, but if you're doing it a day before or whatever, you may be out of luck. Any discussion around that? Not directly, but that's a legitimate concern. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing to think about. I think my immediate reaction is that you don't let the best be the enemy of the good. That you, that you do it, you allow it, and you hope that the internet is there to support you in as many circumstances as you can. I think it's more likely that somebody has internet access in 2023 than access to a, to a post office in a lot of these situations. So you, you try to provide an option that leverages the means of transmission that they're most likely to have access to. Okay, thanks. And you'll, you'll see, I, it's not directly to your point, but a little bit related, that the language is written that you have to get these back. Right now it's written you have to get these back to the clerk by the day before the election. I actually was just talking with Carol yesterday that we might want to modify that. There's other places in the bill where we refer to the last day that the clerk's office is open preceding the election, since a significant amount actually have their last day on the Thursday or Friday before. And so if you just say day preceding, you, you may end up forcing those to come into their office to check on these things, although they can do so online at this point. But the, the goal of that language is to say that they're not coming in, for instance, on election day when the clerk is at the polls, right. where there very well may not be internet access. Good. Yeah. Thanks. So we are going to have Will. We are going to dig into the language of the bill. So I want to take the questions that folks have. We have a couple hands up. Rep Representative Hango next. But if you have a question for Will that you can save until after we hear our guest testify, I'd really appreciate that from the committee. But go ahead, Representative Hango. Thank you. It's just a clarifying question. Did I hear you say that? Um, when ballots would be returned theoretically electronically, the clerk then would take the ballot and print it out off from their um, portal. And then I'm assuming the clerk has access to knowing who sent the ballot and what they're, who they're voting for. Question. So how is that private? It's a good question. It's dealt with in a number of different ways in some of the states I've looked at. Um, currently, the language in the bill, I've tried to keep it fairly broad, which is just, I think, a smart approach to drafting statute, right, to not get too, too many details in the statute. The way it says is that it should be printed and treated the same as all other earlier absentee ballots. A little detail or nuance to that. If it were left that way, how the guidance that I would give to the clerks on that process 
is essentially to mimic the process they use now for the opening of the ballots, which is a two-person process. So I would have the clerk hit print from the system. A separate election official, probably the assistant clerk, would be the one to take it off the printer, okay. fold it, put it in a security envelope. They'll have those, you know, that they send out to the other voters. Seal it, I was just thinking about this this morning, which is the same, you know, that one clerk opens the envelope, hands it to another voter after they turn it over to take the ballot out. The assistant clerk puts it in the envelope, then can hand it back to the clerk to actually write the voter's name on the outside of the envelope at that point and the voter ID and either put it in the bag with the rest of the ballots or process it as they're processing their other. Thank you. Some states just, I know you want to move quickly, Chair McCarthy, and one interesting approach to that that I wasn't totally comfortable with, although the committee could consider this language also, is that voters who choose to use that transmission method acknowledge that they give up their privacy in terms of the clerk processing their ballot. And it's amazing, 95% of the people returning these ballots could care less if the clerk sees the votes. But I prefer a method that dictates a modicum of privacy. I definitely don't mean to rush anyone. I just want to do things in an order where we set up what the heck is the problem we're trying to solve and then really dig into the details about how to solve it. So Representative Hooper, and then we're going to go to our, our guests. And it's a mechanics question, so I'll wait until after. You're okay with that? I, I appreciate that. I want to try to have the, the committee trying to tell a story here, a little bit of my theater experience. Uh, so um, Representative Lori Houghton, uh, Chair of House Health Care, had um, sent me an email a couple weeks ago that she had a constituent who had an issue um, voting while they were out of country. And so Mr. Smith, I appreciate you being with us uh, and joining us remotely today. And um, I'm very interested to hear about your experience with trying to return a ballot. <laughs> uh, so thanks for being with our committee. Uh, thank you for having me. And um, just a clarifying point, I myself did not experience it. I have uh, twin boys, sons, both of them in the military. Um, one of them is on a rotation where he deploys on a regular basis. He's giving up trying to vote. Um, he tried at the early stages. And then I have my other son uh, is actually a full-time guard member here in the state of Vermont. Uh, who was just recently deployed during a voting and was unable to vote uh, through the process. Um, I've raised these children to be very involved in, in their local and state community as I, I feel like that's really the most important, uh, especially if you're going to raise a family, um, that you need to be involved. Give you a basic idea, we've got um, two seats that are gonna come up on our city council and we have two people running um to fill those seats which means you don't have any options which means if those people's views don't align with your views then you need to be involved in in your government so um my family is is very involved very involved and paying attention and their vote is um very important to them um and so to give you the the, the story um when my son from the national guard was deployed just recently. Um, he did get the ballot um, emailed out to him. And then he has to start the process of uh, trying to get it printed, trying to find two different size envelopes, um, getting it filled out, and then finding a stamp and getting it sent back. The military does not like you to use their electronic equipment. Uh, so he got his his um, his ballot through his phone. Um, he cannot connect his phone to any of their printers. You cannot just print anything. And he's actually fortunate where he was at a base where all of this stuff was available to him or was on the premises, but not available to him. And And he's one of the higher ranking members there and still cannot just randomly print something without permission. Um, and then to try to find different size envelopes um, and a stamp to, to mail stuff uh, was unbelievably complicated. And obviously on deployments, you're only at base for a certain amount of time and then you're out on mission for a certain amount of time. 
Um, so as you lengthen this process of first getting permission to try to print something um, and then filling it out and then trying to locate or requisition two different size envelopes to send this back, it is literally a nightmare and extremely time consuming. And then he's in a different country. And thankfully, somebody brought this up. There is a hot topic right now within our community about how they're not receiving mail. It's about every fourth day they're receiving mail because the mail is is having such difficulty um, being delivered at the moment. Um, it, it seems, I think it's, I want to say in our local election, there's potentially 15 or 30 days potentially that he might be able from the time that he gets his ballot to try to get it back. Being overseas, that's nowhere in I are enough time especially for a military person to try to get something printed out, filled out, find envelopes, put it back together and get it mailed out and complete the mission that you've been sent there to do. There is just not that time. Most of these guys are communicating with their families almost on a daily basis, even in a forward operating base via their cell phone through what is going to be the industry standard here, um, I would think through um, two-point authentication. Um, and, and I'm very encouraged from what we're, from what I was hearing about how they would be able to sign in. They're not going to be able to print something and send it back in time. So the fact that they would be able to print it and allow the, or send it to the clerk and have the clerk print it and run it through the machine, and as he said, 95% of these people are voting anyways, as far as their privacy. I will proudly tell you who I voted for if somebody <laughs> asked me. Um, so I understand that we're entitled to our privacy, but when it comes to our vote, we just want to have our vote counted. And we don't particularly care, who knows. Um, so I beg of you to to stay dedicated to this. Um, I. I I think that it does not surprise me that the lawsuits are happening and that they're going to happen. Um, you almost have to uh, put the military, deployed military, uh, in the in the same means of they just don't have the access to get that mail back in a, in, in the amount of time that they're allotted. Um, I get very passionate about this. My son was very passionate when he was calling. We had several conversations. He was so mad that he wasn't gonna be able to get his ballot back. Um, and, and as I said, my son who's in the Air Force has given up even trying. Uh, he doesn't even try to vote when he's deployed. And he's within the SOCOM area. He's on a rotation. He's home for three to four months and then he's deployed again for three to four months on a regular basis. Um, so the majority of the times so that it comes to vote, he's he's deployed somewhere in this world. Um, and he's just given up because there's no way he's getting stuff printed out, mailed back, getting it back in time. And, and that's that's just not fair. It, it, these these people are are dedicated to our to our country and our process. Um, they're our first responders. They when they're home. Um, these people deserve to have their vote counted. And would I, I just recently had a loan, never saw a person, did it completely online. Everything's completely legal. Um, the amount of things that we can do online, uh, and, and, I, and I get electronic and online is different, right? Once you, once you bring the internet in, there's, there's something a little more serious about that as far as security, but... <laughs> You know, if, if I can be hacked and have my personal information taken away from me in so many different forms that I'm doing right now, that if it happened in the process of me getting my vote in, it'd be a whole lot easier to swallow. And it'd be a whole lot easier to swallow from my sons. And I am not saying do not take security lightly. I want you to take it as important as it needs to be. But please let my sons vote. I, I've raised them to, to be that way. They're going to raise their children to be that way. It would not surprise me if my some of my grandchildren end up in the military. Please count their vote. Mr. Smith, thank you so much for your testimony, for your son's service. Um, 
really appreciate you joining us and telling their story today. Um, are there folks who have any clarifying questions or anything they'd like to? I think you told a story that's very compelling and uh, illustrates what we're trying to accomplish with this proposal from the elections uh, division director. I, and I really appreciate you being here. If you uh, want to stick around as we uh, hear a little bit more about the mechanics of that, if you want to stay in the Zoom room, I'd be happy to, to have you stay with us. Uh, is there anything else you want to tell the committee before we hear a little bit more about the mechanics of how this works? Yeah, there was just one more comment that is, so this is my second time testifying. I can't remember if it was last year or the year before that I, that I told this story. Um, and some of the military people were there and I forget who the gentleman was, um, but he talked about that the electronic system was out there. Um, and one of the things that he said that delayed the initiation of this was the military security end of it. And, and thankfully, it sounds like we're taking the military piece out of the equation with the electronics that I'm hearing is being developed right now. And I, I fully believe that's what you need to do um, because the security, obviously, that the military has to have, especially within a foreign country. Um, so the, the limit to their equipment is, is very, very limited. And as I mentioned earlier, these guys are calling home from a forward operating base that doesn't have printers um, or envelopes or um, mail at those forward operating bases. Uh, they are calling home on their cell phone and they're able to internet, they have, uh, access the internet um, from their forward operating bases. Um, so please keep it into the, into the uh, between our state governments and our local governments and our individual voters. Uh, and do not try to get the military permission. I, not that I'm saying that wouldn't be a good thing if we could do that, but uh, the military is not going to compromise their security in any way, shape, or form. Um, and, and the fact that we're all carrying many computers in our pockets no matter where we go, um, I, I think that's the way to go. And I, I'm encouraged by what I'm hearing, and please stick with it and please make it happen. And, and that would be my final comment. Um, if you're willing, Representative Hooper had a, a question for you. Sure. Thank you for coming and talking with us, Mr. Smith. Uh, it's just sort of a simple question. When you talk to your sons who are deployed, how often do you do it eye to eye like we're doing here as opposed to voice to ear? Um, how, well, how often is, is video available? I would. Uh, for my son in the Air Force, the, the video seems to be more available than my son when he was deployed. Um, and honestly, my sons also have their own families now. So most of the video conferencing was uh, reserved for their wives and their children, um, which I can't blame them. Dad generally got a phone call, uh, but I did have several video chats as well um, from, the, uh, from, from my son who's in the Air Force. For my son uh, in the military or in the... Um, the Army, uh, the majority of those conversations were either a phone call or text messaging. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, so I really appreciate being here, Mr. Smith. Uh, feel free to stick on the Zoom room if you want to see the rest of uh, <laughs> the testimony on this piece. Uh, and also feel free to sign off if you prefer to do that. Um, I am uh, going to. Um, say that we should probably take a look at this section of the bill unless uh, director sending you you want to do any more teeing up before we have tim walk us through and if you want to stay stay up and just we'll have tim up as well that might make sense tim doesn't mind and I, but i will um really quickly i i made it through all of my comments well but listening to mr smith reminded me of a few additional things i just want to emphasize um i didn't speak uh, specifically to kind of the timeline but he is entirely correct to say that the, the local elections, what we're coming up to right now, present even more difficulty. Under the law, ballots for local elections only have to be ready 20 days before the election. And that's where Mr. Smith was saying they have, at most, you know, 20, but more. If I electronically deliver on the 20th day, they've got 20 days to get it back. In the context of the federal elections, pres primary, August and November, it's back to the 45-day deadline that's mm -hmm. driven by 
the Yuokava law that I referred to beforehand. I mean, that was sort of the first step at the federal level that they took to try and increase the opportunity for military and overseas voters to return ballots was this requirement that we have ballots ready 45 days before. That's what in the past got us to move in the primary and everything else. And that's where I think I described to you the other day, if they've got a pending request with us, which most of these folks do because they're on top of it and care as much as Mr. Smith was saying, that's when we blast those ballots out electronically right on that 45th day. And even that, even, even having the PDF in their hand or the, the accessible option online on the 45th day, you still, you still are presented with the difficulties he described in getting it back. I wanted to quickly put a pin on it that um, Mr. Smith, again, used the term, these are your first responders. In many cases, the military is, right? There are other first responders that go out and are deployed these days to the ever-increasing number of natural disasters we have. Uh, the former Secretary of State, Secretary Condos, the next, one of the next steps he wanted to take, and which I'd like the committee to think about, if not this year and years coming, is expanding this subset of voters to first responders that may be deployed to natural disasters, et cetera. Secretary, former Secretary Condos always used to tell a story about when the state, a large contingent of Vermont State Police got deployed to respond to Hurricane Sandy. And it was a couple days, I think, before either the, I think the November general election that year. And he ended up in conversations with the head of the state police trying to figure out how to get uh, ballots down to these state troopers and return back in time. And in fact, I don't think they were able to. And that always stuck in the former Secretary Congress. <coughs> Another group that maybe had this policy applied to them. Um, and really quickly also, Mr. Smith referred a, a bunch to the hesitancy to use military technology to um, accomplish any of this. He couldn't be more correct. That's one of the reasons why it's advanced sort of so slowly. There have been a lot of people over time that have asked the, the military how the, the DOD, how we might leverage certain technology they have to do so. And there's been a, a tension and just a consistent desire not to do so on their part. Really quickly, former Secretary Condos and I, just to tell you how long I've thought about this and what depth, were part of a, a, a subgroup of a Council of State Governments group called the Overseas Voting Initiative. This is one of the pieces of, of material that we put out two or three years ago about examining the sustainability of balloting solutions for military and overseas voting. If you look closely, you can see me and the former secretary on an aircraft carrier here out in San Diego. <laughs> but I, I, I raise it to say that it was a lot of time spent talking to members of the military who were deployed in various scenarios describing how difficult it is to get ballots back on time and learning from that experience. And with that, I'll take any questions anyway. All right. uh, questions from Representative Hooper and then Representative Morgan, and then we'll have Tim come up and walk us through the section. How many ballots are we talking about here? In Good question. <laughs> I should get you those exact numbers. We should have had them prepared in front of me. Not percent. over 2,000 statewide. So it's, it's the mechanics question, and the reason I asked Mr. Smith to talk to you to see your actual son. I, I have a 95 year old aunt who doesn't see very well anymore. When she gets a bill, she holds it up in front of her Facebook device, and I take a screenshot of it and pay the bill. Um, we might be behind in this, but this system seems pretty convoluted, and when I walk into the polls, the poll worker looks at me and says, hi, Bob, and gives me a ballot, and I do stuff with it. Uh, if we gave access to to the town clerks to have access to the photos in DMV for validity's sake. It seems like maybe we're chasing an old dog here, technology wise. You could have a one on one conversation I, with somebody I, I, and I they just, either show you a ballot that you're <laughs> that they have filled out and the town clerk takes a screenshot of it and processes it or processes for the individual just by saying I want that guy. I want that lady. Depending on how much faith we want to put in our fact clutters, but 2,000 ballots seems like a pretty small it is. number for what we're going to pay and the technicality of the My thought. I think we're a user. 
Representative Morgan, go ahead. <laughs> uh, the thing I was going to say, it's just a statement, not a question, Greg, but is that what we're, we would be up against, the military has got pretty heavy firewalls yeah. on their system, so we'd have to see what the mechanism would be to break through that firewall via the DOD systems, if you would. I think there's going to be a, a look that needs to be given that if this were be accepted as part of it. So it's it sounds to me, and this so this brings up a question actually for Will, which would be the idea here, if I'm understanding it right, is that while it might be going through the internet connection that is provided on some bases and in some places, what we were talking about with Mr. Smith's example of his sons really was about their own personal device, personally ac accessing publicly available cellular service that was right. not part of the secure systems of right. the military branch in which they were serving. So it gets around, it gets around that. So it, it would still require them to have access to some non-secure internet system, whether it was cellular or wired, in order to access this. But if they're accessing the internet for any reason, like if they're able to FaceTime with their family, then they'd be able to do this. Yes. Otherwise, they'd have to figure out some way to print a ballot under the current yeah. system and mail it back. And it sounds like it's really that printing that's the challenge. Like if you're if you're serving in the Peace Corps in Uganda, or you're a forward operating deployed um, service person like Mr. Smith's son, that the idea that you're gonna have access to a printer <laughs> in time to get that ballot mail yeah, back, yeah. that's that's the thing. But so it's that they would still need to be on a non-secure internet system. I yeah, think. and that wouldn't always be the case because, especially in a forward operating base, a FOB. Uh, you would very likely that's your source of internet. So I, I just throw it out there for food for thought as you come home about it. So Will, am I right in thinking that the idea isn't necessarily that that person who you know they're serving in a very secure environment, you know, where they don't have access to publicly available internet, but if you in that forty-five day window before a general election, if at some point during that time they, you know, move they go to some place where they have access to the internet, maybe they wouldn't be able to mail a ballot back in time, but if they have access to the internet, then they can just vote right there. Is that the idea? Yes. And I, and I would want to even look further. I mean, I, I defer to the expertise here at the table, but it is, it's just about having a, a internet access. And so if that internet access was being provided somehow by the military, not publicly available in one of these locations, I think it would just be about the policy around use of that internet connection. It may very well be that as long as they, they can identify themselves as a service member and log in, that then they can use it for this purpose. I, I don't want to say that I know that that option even is foreclosed. The pushback was more against the sort of development, the military hosting the portal, for instance. Ah. Um, use of, and, and somebody can correct me whether, but, if I'm referring to it wrong, the CAC card, is it CAC or? CAC card. CAC card. That's your ID, it also has a chip in it that gets you logged into your computer device. There was some device. hesitancy, I think, toward, toward yeah. having the ballot be returned upon access through the CAC card. Right. Um, CAC is common access card. Common so access card. Yeah. But I, I do think that as long as the policy of whatever internet you're accessing would allow for it, this that's the only way that this would touch the military regs. My question is probably better addressed to Representative Chase. My recollection from Iraq and a couple of other places is that there's usually a community of video phones set up for. That was before my time. I was uh, getting money in Croatia and Bosnia and not yeah. sandy in <laughs> Iraq and Afghanistan. It falls into the it depends yeah. on uh, your yeah. location mm -hmm. again. How well, these don't use internet as much as they use. Uh, a cell phone requires a cell tower. Uh, none of them are bouncing off any yeah, satellites. But yeah, and again, the military could restrict yeah. how much of that can go in and out. That, that's why. Yeah. But at some point in that whole month before the election, if even if you're if you're able to get into a publicly available internet, right. then you're not. 
sort of having to mail your ballot and it takes weeks to get from wherever you're deployed. Yeah, go ahead, Representative Chase. One quick point oh, yes. on that, just quickly, to put a, a touch on that, is that if you, if you envision it right, you're getting it electronically delivered. So at some point to access it and, and see that it's been delivered to you, you need that internet access. You can turn this process around in about five minutes. I would, I would my, my, my uh, guess would be that most people do it right then when it's delivered. You know, you're sitting there online, you don't know what's gonna happen the next day at the base. So boom, I get it, I make my choices, I hit submit. Representative And the, they can still request a paper ballot be delivered and uh, so if you, in a, a sporadic uh, internet situation, you can request ahead of time to have a paper ballot delivered. So it's kind of, yep. uh, internet access isn't the only option. Correct, and, and good point. And I think at this point, back of the envelope, 90% are still requesting electronically, but we have a subset of the Yuokawa voters who still like to have the ballot mailed and have developed a system, I guess, for making sure they get it back. Well, I'd like to invite uh, Tim to come up and uh, walk us through uh, draft 2.7 and Director Senning, if you want to stay uh, in the co-pilot seat <laughs> and give us context or answer questions, that'd be great. Thanks so much for your work on this, Tim. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, for the record, my name is uh, Tim Devlin, Legislative Council. And a uh, quick question for you, Chair McCarthy. Did you want me to start with the election ballot return language, or did you want me to kind of walk through the entire bill at this point? Um, why don't we uh, focus right now on just the new, I think it's section 12, um, yes. that has this ballot return language, and then um, we'll take a quick break and then go through the, the other new stuff. That sounds good. So before you, you have um, draft 2.7 of the committee bill uh, number 23-0705. And the pertinent language that we're going to be looking at is at the bottom of page 9. Um, just for your visual reference, uh, everything that's highlighted has been introduced since um, uh, you last saw this uh, ability to walk through it uh, together. Um, one initial note I'd like to make about this, uh, just regarding the section numbers, is um, I uh, had mistakenly inserted these new sections um, probably in the incorrect place. It should probably be a few sections back um, versus uh, 12. It should be maybe uh, 15 and 16 rather than 12 and 13. Apologies, but um, just wanted to put that out there before going on. Um, the sections under the part uh, regarding electronic ballot returns are 12 and 13, two sections. Section 12 permits uh, the ballot certificate to be electronically formatted, and section 13 permits voters who are ill, injured, or have a disability, as well as military and overseas voters to electronically return ballots via an online portal hosted by the Secretary of State's office. <coughs> uh, plenty by now. To, to Tim, just yes. to, I want to really be uh, deliberate about exactly what we're talking about, and I know Director Senning did a good job. So just to be totally clear, we're, we're saying uh, this section applies just to those uh, voters who currently are able to, to get their ballot sent to them electronically, overseas voters, military service people, and uh, Vermont voters with disabilities. And that the portal would be the one set up by the Secretary of State. So it's, it's all controlled by the Secretary of State. Yes. So turning to the language on the page, uh, section 12 amends Title 17 BSA, section 2342. Section 242542 is labeled uh, signing certificate. Subsection A reads, there shall be printed on the face of the envelope provided for use in returning early, vo early voter absentee ballots or provided in electronic format if a ballot is electronically delivered pursuant to subsections 2539B or C, a certificate in substantially the following form. And then it's the text of the um, uh, certification language. Early or absentee voter ballots of blank, print your name, I 
blank solemnly swear or affirm that I am a resident of the town, city of blank, state of Vermont, and that I am a legal voter in this town, city. And then align for the signature. Subsection B reads, the early or absentee voter, except the voter receiving a ballot electronically delivered pursuant to subsections 2539B or C of this title, must sign the certificate on the outside of the envelope in order for the ballot to be valid. When an earlier absentee voter is physically unable to sign the voter's name, the voter may mark an X or take an oath swearing or affirming to the statement on the certificate. The officers who delivered the ballots shall witness the mark or oath and sign their names with a statement attesting to the fact on the envelope. I'll pause there, and I'd just like to also note that the reference to subsections 2539B and C refer to those um, uh, voting groups that are um, electronically voting. B is uh, those voters who are injured, ill, or have a disability. Subsection C of that is military and overseas voters. And just real quick, if I can jump in, this, this was really the cleanup. Tim actually noticed this certificate language. I was focused on the, what we'll look at later. And this just says that the same language has to be provided in the electronic format that is put on the envelopes that are mailed to everybody else. So this is the? We're already doing it, but it's good to codify it. Any questions about the section 12 pieces? All right, I think we're good to move on. Section 13 amends Title 17 VSA Section 2543, which is titled Return of Ballots, specifically subsection D and subdivision 1. Skip down to there. And this is uh, breaks across the bottom of page 10 into 11. D1 um, uh, has been largely left in to provide context. Uh, the actual changes are on D2. Would you like me to skip down, uh, Chair, yeah. or read through them? Uh, no, that's fine. I, okay. I think we're, we're pretty familiar with uh, those. The, under one are the current ways you can return a ballot, and this is going to add the new means under two. Two reads beginning on line 10. 2A. All ballots electronically delivered pursuant to subsections 2539B or C of this title and returned as follows shall be counted. Uh, I, by means of a secure online portal developed and maintained by the Secretary of State and directly to the clerk before the close of business on the day preceding the election. And I, I with electronic signature on the certificate required pursuant to section 2542 of this title prior to submitting the ballot, on the ballot to the clerk. B, a ballot electronically delivered pursuant to subsections 2539B or C of this title and then returned pursuant to subdivision 2A of the subdivision shall be printed by the clerk and proceeded in the same manner as all other earlier absentee ballots and in accordance with the procedures prescribed by this subchapter. Representative Higgins. Yeah, if I could. So on line 14, uh, when it talks about on the day preceding the election, is this Will where maybe you wanted to make some corrections? That's where we could, we could instead refer to the last day that the clerk's office is open preceding the election. OK. And I, and I think that makes sense. OK. Um, seems that seems reasonable to me uh, so should we go ahead and say for Tim when we see draft 2.8 or 3.0 that we'll <laughs> we'll make that uh, we'll make that change it's my experience the clerk is kind of in email contact with these voters most typically anyway and so we'll be saying you know get it to me before Thursday when my I'm gonna be out of the office but it makes sense to put it in there yeah I'm uh, always conscious that we if we're making these accessibility changes like we did last biennium, uh, that I want to be, especially in the early stages of making a big change, uh, not not putting undue burden on the clerk. So we we are expanding this a lot, but I just want to make sure we're mindful of the clerks. Yes, Representative Hango. Is there a way that if this if these ballots are going to be sent out electronically to begin with? 
a, a disclaimer is put right on that original email that contains the ballot that they need to be returned by a certain date. Yes. Because that would eliminate the clerk then having to remind people or specifically let people know. Because it would already be on there. If you are going to be returning this electronically, it must be done by X exactly. date. Good suggestion, Representative Hayden. All right. Any other clarifications on this piece before Tim moves on? All right, let's keep going. Let's see, turning to the top of page 12, this is um, subdivision D2C. The voter shall be notified when a ballot electronically delivered pursuant to subsections 2539B or C of this title and then returned pursuant to subdivision A or 2A of this sub subdivision is received and printed by the clerk pursuant to subdivision 2B of this subdivision. Three, an early voter absentee ballot returned in a manner other than those set forth in subdivisions 1 or 2A of the subsection shall not be counted. So uh, C is a lot of, lot of cross-referencing. So you're saying the voter has to be notified when their ballot has been returned and printed by the clerk. Yes. And that is accomplished through the My Voter page. Would that be enough here? Or is there something, is there some other notification that we're talking about? I, I, read, I read this and put it in there to require kind of another level of direct notification in this instance, rather than just the received date, which you know you can see on the page. For the reason of, I just think there's enough, um, it, it's for voters like Mr. Smith's sons who are so invested and have taken the steps and, and may be concerned about the internet because there a glitch in the, in the access when I hit submit on this. When I hit submit on the button, did it really happen? I suppose just the receipt date on the My Voter page could accomplish that also. But I think having another level of, hey, I got this one that you submitted electronically, it's printed out, you're all set, it's going to be counted with everybody else's ballots, was my intent there. Okay. Representative Hanko. So then are you envisioning um, the clerk or assistant clerk having to compose a separate email to each individual who submits electronically? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Although you asking that question, um, gives me the thought that we could easily set it up as a system generated email as soon as the clerk gets print. I think that, that would boom be sufficient and, and easier on the clerks. Yep, that's a good thought. We do that with a number of- That was literally all the pieces I was thinking. I was like, did we email back? And then I was thinking like a form response. So they checked my boxes. Cool. Other questions about uh, the words on the page? For this section and the mechanics of how this might work. I think um, before we, uh, that we will obviously have uh, Carol when she's up for it uh, yeah. in the next couple of days, give us some feedback on this section, but um, any other thoughts on this from the committee? Well, I just wanted to ask, um, so when the when the clerk prints the ballot in this way, is it the same printing that they're using for the assisted voter system? Yes. So there's no real distinction between a ballot that's filled out by someone with a disability that shows up in person versus someone who returns their ballot electronically this way, in terms of like the ballot's printed the same way, Correct. the ballot appears the same. No, and thanks for asking because that's actually a unique part of our system that's really nice, is that what prints out looks and feels exactly like all other ballots, except that probably the ovals are marked much more cleanly than most of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Um, but because you asked and brought that up, I want to say these printers actually that we've developed with the system, I think I've said this before, can actually print on the tabulator readable stock and make it so that these ballots don't have to be transferred. And so what we'll do is order a small amount of stock for each of the clerks to have for the early voting and for the polling place for ballots that come off so that they can be directly taken off the printer and into the tabulator if that's the case. 
Great. So I would like to uh, give the committee a short break before we go into the whole bill. Um, so let's say that um, we're doing a 10 minute break with a couple minutes to spare. So we will be starting at 1120 sharp and I'll, we'll go off live and I'll see everybody back at 1120. All right. So we're back. I believe this will be our third installment on our YouTube stream of the House of Ops and Military Affairs Committee uh, here on this lovely Wednesday morning. And so uh, we're back for a walkthrough of, um, I believe we're on draft number 2.7. Uh, Am I right about that? Yes. Uh, yes, 2.7 is the latest, sorry. Too many tabs open. Uh, so, um, Tim, thanks for being with us. We'll um, start at the top, and um, if, if you wanna skim through some of the things we've seen, we can take this at a first <laughs> pace, and then we'll, we'll stop you when uh, we, we have questions. Um, and before Tim really goes through the walkthrough, um, I'll tee this up. Um, so after hearing much of the testimony we had last week uh, and also taking um, some of the thoughts that we've kind of heard over the last few days and, and this morning even um, with Mr. Rogers' testimony, I uh, am putting on the table here with some of these new sections, not just the uh, electronic returns uh, issue that uh, Director Senning has brought, but also some new uh, proposals that I would view uh, generally as a compromise around the ability to uh, continue to have multiple parties uh, nominated, listed on a general election ballot for Vermont candidates. Um, so I'll have Tim kind of walk us through, but basically this is this is my attempt at uh, trying to square many of the things, not probably not all, uh, but many of the uh, requests that we've heard in testimony and some of the concerns folks had about the elimination of multiple nominations. So Tim, take, take it away. Thank you very much, Chair McCarthy. Again, for the record, my name is Tim Devlin, Legislative Council. Um, the bill you have before you, the draft is 2.7. Um, the committee bill number is 230705. And the changes, um, as I mentioned before, have been uh, highlighted between draft versions uh, just for um, identifying uh, new text. Um, broad strokes quickly. Uh, these highlighted changes uh, accomplish a few different uh, goals. One is, um, let's see, uh, provides a candidate uh, parties to be printed on ballots in a certain order, uh, removes the prohibition of cross nominations, adds minimum thresholds for writing candidates in primary elections, and as we had already uh, discussed, uh, addresses electronic uh, ballot return. Also, and you'll kind of see this as kind of one off little highlights, um, we took the opportunity between drafts to correct some statutory cross-references and um, bring some of the text into conformity with our legislative council drafting conventions and standards. So um, just kind of making my way through the bill, top to bottom. Uh, the first highlight you'll see is under the sore loser um, uh, act at the bottom of page one. That's just merely changing uh, the word uh, may to shall for clarification. Skipping down to the highlight on page two, um, you'll see the same thing. Now entering the part four, let's see, independent candidate filing deadlines has not been altered. That's on page uh, three, or two. Page three, campaign finance limit for statewide candidates has also not been altered. Also at the bottom of page three, biennial committee reorganization reporting has not been altered, actually, has not been altered. Near the top of page four, we see the first um, area of substantive change, and this is candidate parties printed on ballots. That's the reading, uh, reader assistance heading right there. And we jump into section six, which amends Title 17, BSA, section 2474, or choice of party. Now, some of this was already being amended in previous drafts, but um, now um, it's been amended in a different and distinct way. So I've just kind of highlighted the entirety of this section for our purposes. You can see, let's see, on line eight, we have uh, the, let's see, uh, subdivision A1 has been removed in entirety, and two has been modified to 
basically take the place of one, and I'll just read it as follows. Subsection A of section 2474, a, a candidate is nominated by more than, <coughs> sorry, if a candidate is nominated by more than one party, the Secretary of State shall print on the ballot those parties next to the candidate's name by listing in this order. One, the major political party for which the nominee has uh, his or her name printed on the ballot in the primary. Two, any major political parties for which the nominee received writing votes in any order from highest to lowest vote counts. I should note here that should probably read any major political parties for which the nominee is nominated, not receives writing votes. And I, we intend to make that edit going forward. Three is, um, sorry, three and four are substantially the same, or are indeed the same, just uh, renumbered. And uh, these edits right here just kind of shift the order um, of what was um, B followed by C is now actually really C before B. And I can pause there if we want to talk about uh, the significance of that change, or we can kind of go into subsection B and kind of finish out this section if you want. I think it would help if I give a three-sentence description of what happened there. If you can see the stricken through language from the old A1 was the process by which, so any candidate at any level ends up receiving more than one nomination. They had the opportunity there under A1, if you read through the strike through, to notify our office of the order in which they wanted those parties to appear. So you get the R. Right. They, they would get nominated, say, by the Democratic Party by primary, the Progressive Party by committee nomination. They could still send an email to our office and say, I'd like to be listed as DPD or DP, what have you. Um, if they did not do that, right, within the time frame, this is when we're in the crunch to create the general election balance. So we got to put time frames and deadlines on these things. It was 10 days, I believe. 5 p.m. on the 10th day following. If they didn't do so, we then had to have a fallback standard order in which we put those multiple party nominations on the ballot. That's what we reverted to for what now will just be the dictated order. The candidate doesn't have the option under this language as it is to tell our office to switch. And instead it says we are gonna list them on the general election ballot in the following order. And to summarize A, B, C, D, it's the, the party you had your name on the ballot in the primary and won, so put your printed name on the ballot. Then if you were to have received the nomination by write-in votes, that major party would be next. Then any party by which the committee, a party committee nominated you, major party, and then a minor party committee nomination. That's gonna be the default order in which they fall under this language. And as Tim noted, uh, uh, with regard to the write-in one, it's drafted right now to say any party in which you receive write-in votes, that was not the intent. <coughs> It should be, you know, a party by which you won the right of nomination would be in that slot, that third slot. Representative Chase. <coughs> We've talked about uh, primaries and, and then uh, write-ins and uh, <laughs> nominations. I've just been kind of assuming, but I figured I should probably ask out loud, can a person have their name on more than one party's primary? No. That it's specifically not allowed in the law. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Representative Hanko. So not to be <coughs> obtuse about this, but there have been a number of versions floating around. This is seems to me like a, a total turnaround from what was previously in language. I would say not a total turnaround, but a uh, halfway. <laughs> so right. So as I, as I teed up before, this is my attempt at a compromise around this issue about fusion candidates. So the way I would fra frame this uh, for what I'm trying to accomplish is that the original proposal on the table just said, you pick a lane, you only get that one nomination, and you cannot have a second one. Yeah. This says, you file as a DNR okay. for one party. That is the first one that will appear on the general election ballot if you win. And as we'll hear further, if you do win that party primary, 
You could also um, either be written in or um, nominated to fill a, a vacancy by another party and get, take a second or per, perhaps even a third or fourth uh, party designation. So it allows us to preserve for folks who have the intent of truly having more than one party nominated and they have a real desire to have that as a candidate on the ballot so that they can say to voters, you know, I have been nominated by this party and this party and maybe even a third or a fourth party, this allows that to stay in place. So this is a compromise where it's raising the threshold for doing that um, and also saying that the one you file on has to be the first one that appears, but it is not completely getting rid of the potential for so-called fusion candidates. So thank you for that. that so I'm, I'm understanding the first listing is the party that you um, declared that you were going to run on that ballot in the primary. Any write-ins that come in during the primary, this does not address that. You have to have a, an actual party nomination to be on the general election ballot um, as a dual party. Or so we're candidate. we're we're going to get we're going to get into that in the next pieces. But what I'll say is that the intent here is that. Similar to the way it is today, if you, and, uh, and assuming that you want that nomination, you would file your consent to be a writing candidate. So we part of what's, what, I, what you have to hold in your head here is that this, this bill in its entirety envisions this new thing of filing a consent to be a writing candidate and that get your votes counted. So, in May? No, or later. after no, but the, the Friday before the Friday before for, the, for a primary election. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea is if I'm, you could do it in May, but the idea is that you would file and say, okay, I'm running as, let's say, a Democrat, mm -hmm. and I also would like to be a writing candidate and try to get the Republican nomination as well. And so if I filed my consent form and my petition for my May. first one, for my D, in May, and then sometime between May and the Friday before the Friday before the primary election, I would also file a consent to say I'd like to have my votes counted in the R. So I, I have, as a candidate, some intent to actually want to be a fusion candidate. Okay. But all I have to do is just file that form. Then further, I'm saying you need to get at least 10% plus one of the write-ins uh, on of the total ballots cast. So if there are 500 Republican ballots cast in your district in that primary, you would need to get 51 votes. So that we're raising the threshold at least to where uh, I think Representative Shai was trying to make it in H97, where instead of it being you know, 25, 25 yeah. it's at least 10% or the number of signatures, whatever's higher. So that's what you're going to see uh, in the, the further sections that Tim will walk us through. Okay. And just one Sorry. last thing. Um, so that essentially throws out any, <coughs> if you don't do all that and you don't receive the, the prescribed number of votes, that throws out any votes that somebody would write you in on the ballot, but you don't get enough, so their vote essentially is gone, thrown out, it doesn't matter, right? So I, I, what we're specifically talking about here is just the ability to get a second nomination. So that candidate would, are, would still appear if they won their major party primary that they had filed in. They'd still appear on the general election ballot. So I would, I would say that those votes are similar to when somebody, for instance, like I had some people write in my name on the other two primary ballots where I wasn't a written candidate, I wasn't seeking that party's nomination, I'm glad there were a handful of people who liked me that affiliate with other parties, that's great, but it didn't actually advance me at all in the primary because I wasn't seeking those nominations. They're, those, in, the, in a sense, are kind of count the same as if somebody wrote their own name in. So, yep. oh, sorry. Uh, what would happen in a situation where that candidate lost their primary primary but won the right for the other party? Under, under this, 
if you file on that thing and you lose the, the, the primary, we, this, this bill envisions a sore loser law so that you would not be able to appear on the general election ballot. I would note, since we're right there, I think we would have to amend the language to accomplish that goal. Right now it says you can't be nominated by another party's committee. It doesn't foreclose the option of you winning by write-in in, in right. another party. Exactly. Okay. If that was the intent of the committee, we'd have to write that in. Okay. Right. So right now, is that's 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 right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the way this is crafted right now, that if you could potentially lose your major party nomination but then also be, but then win yeah, a write-in for an, an open and have your name appear on the ballot. That's how I read this, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Interesting. Yes. That was not my intent in the drafting, so. Uh, <laughs> the, the, that's why we're doing this. That's why we're doing it. I was reading the same way. I was yeah. like, mm, I think this is not what we're looking at. Yeah. yeah. The, other, the other part of this that I think that's flawed in your thinking is, you're thinking that the people that voted for you as a D are a D, and they, they may not be. You can pull. You can pull a Democratic ballot and be a Republican. Oh, of course, yep. So, you know, I, I think the way you explained it to me, it sounded like, uh, and, and Representative Hangel was talking about it too, as far as those D votes not necessarily showing up uh, that way, where, I, again, that's, that's what I don't want to lose in a sense, because a lot of those may be Republicans that voted for me, but they pulled a Democratic ballot. So, uh, so if I'm, I want to understand the, the that I think the issue you're bringing up is specific to um, the the idea that we're only counting the write-ins when somebody says they they want to they've consented to be a candidate. So mm -hmm. you're you're saying that you you would prefer that those still be published, that those be recorded and published. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think, I think when we have, um, I did not think that would be the, the key point of uh, thinking in this, at this point, this juncture in the conversation, but I'm, I'm glad to have that flat. <laughs> uh, Representative Morgan, go ahead. Maybe I'm getting ahead, but and tell me, if, yeah, I'm sure you're telling me that, but to, to go one step further, you win your, as Seth called it, your primary, primary that you filed for in May, you get the, 10% plus one for the other party, um, and you are the number one, that gets you to the number one in that party as well, then what? Am I making sense or am I got it wrong? So, so if you've essentially yeah. won, if you've won two, yeah. two primaries, yeah, then, then you right. get to have two names printed on the ballot. So that was really the That's the compromise. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yeah, you got it now. That's exactly it. That's what okay. I was trying to get on the table was. Right. That's what I thought you were getting at. Yeah. Well. I think that's the, because it's, uh, okay. So the, yeah, that is a, that is a, that's a change for what we were, yeah, okay. Yes. Oh, so yeah. that's the compromise. Okay, got it. So, and is it the fusion candidate Congress, the concept still exists here, it's just sort of the access to it, to this structure. Yeah. So, so but when, then when you're looking, I'm getting even another step now, so then they go to list you in the general election, you would be then a RDDR, or no? Oh, no, so, what yeah, so you can only- I'm missing a component here, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, you, on it, but. so, so we have three major par party primaries, right? Yeah. And so if you win the one you filed in, so let's say I run as a Democrat, I yeah. win that one, you got file that. to get the P, for instance. Yeah. And I get the 10% plus one, yeah. I'm automatically in there. Then I could be, a d in, under this, a, a Democratic slash progressive on the ballot. On the, on the general election ballot. Right. Yes. And that's what I think you were saying. About that's what I'm saying. Yes. You still would have that fusion candidate capability. Yes. Yes. I thought we were trying to wipe that out completely. Was not. I'm just saying as that was why we thought we were heading. And now it's. So after hearing very strong sentiment on the, both on the committee and from the folks testifying, I am putting on the table for the committee's consideration today the idea that instead of getting rid of the 
second nomination possibility, the fusion candidate possibility, that I'm raising the threshold and making it okay. more intentional the key, than I think it is today. The key being the 10% the plus one of them. Gotcha. Okay. Well, and also you do need to file the intent to the Friday. Yeah. The Friday. It has to be, yeah. has to be yeah. deliberate. Yeah. Like recognizing as an individual that you are in fact seeking. It, it can because you put a Facebook post out saying, please do this, you gotta be deliberate about it. Very much. Yeah. Oh, that messed me up then with what you just said. Because my understanding was that if you got that 10% plus one, regardless of whether or not you filled out the consent form for that party, you would get it. But now you're telling me you still have to file that consent form, even if you get, you know, the 10% plus one. Right. Well, you're doing it ahead of the As draft. Draft. As As draft. Draft. Before the vote was even held. Yes. Yeah. So, so what, what this envisions is that somebody who wants to be a fusion candidate it's a pretty low, I mean, you just have to file a consent form a week and a half before the election um, and, and then get the votes. But you'd still have to be a victor, though. You couldn't just be that you got 10%. You'd have to be enough. Oh, yes. Yeah, you can't just be, you know, you'd yeah. be like fifth in the pile and go because you got 10%. You've got to be the right. one or two if it's a two-seat district number one or a two-seat district one or two. Yeah. That, yes. right. And it's the, the plurality language that I think is in here helps accomplish that. Okay. And if and uh, I'm seeing Director Senning mm -hmm. calculating through listening to these questions, so if you have anything you can say to clarify any of my comments, that'd be great. Just a little bit, and just because it seems like we're at a point of good understanding here, that the hypothetical that was laid out is right. You know, the, the, the primary you filed the petition in, you win that. Yeah. That's going to be, you get the D. If, and it, it is what you said, Rep Higley, you both file the form and meet the threshold, is how it's drafted right now, you could get the next party's nomination. Yes. What we were just looking at under the choice of party, the effect of that is that you can no longer flip those. This is telling you what order those need to go in, and it puts the one you filed in first. Your primary one is would be your first. The one that you won by right in, second. And then I just wanted to note that there is, there's still the third option under here, too, to be entirely clear, that a party committee can then also nominate. Correct. So you did DER, you, you filed in D, you filed the write-in paperwork and met the threshold, so you got the R that way. Mm -hmm. You could also have the Progressive Party Committee nominate you as a P. And under the order laid out here, you would at that point be DRP. It puts uh, uh, you were securing a nomination by write-in in second place, and then by committee nomination in third place. If you're allowing for dual nominations, unless you want to carve out something else that says except not by party committee, you have to do that. You have to be clear because that's a valid way to nominate a candidate still under the chapter. I think at at, at this point, what I was hoping to accomplish, what I was hearing from. All of the experience, testimony, my you know years of doing elections and participating in them in one way or another, was that the process of nominating have a little bit more integrity than it has today, and I and I hold intention and and I think one of the reasons our brains melt when we think about all of this is all of us have different ideas of what the party nominating process is for who the selectorate, who selects our candidates should be. <laughs> and I think uh, to Representative Higley's point, you know, we, we uh, there's nothing in here that um, changes the fact that we have open primaries where a person who most of the time votes in one major party's mm. primaries or for that uh, party's candidates on a general election ballot, they can, choose in any given primary year to vote in another party's primary. That's, yeah. that's been the status quo in Vermont, and this bill doesn't change that. But it does say if you want to have multiple nominations, you, you should be a little more intentional about it, or allow the party committee mm -hmm. to, to be part of that nominating process. So this does preserve intentionally. I wanted to preserve yeah. the party nominating to fill a vacancy. But so it's more, it's more deliberate, it's more formalized is a good way to put it, I guess. Yeah, and I, I would say that, um, and I know some folks will, will not like this, but I, I think that for, for me, I care about my party's brand, mm -hmm. 
And I think that in many Democrats, many Republicans for their brand, we heard the chair of the Vermont GOP talk about this exact thing. So this is not a partisan uh, thing, but in, in each of our parties, I think we care about like, what is the, the nominating, what is that badge that's on, that's officially printed on a ballot, the general election ballot for all those voters? What is the designation of that primary uh, of that party mean? What does it actually mean? What does it signify? And it's almost like a Rorschach test right now. <laughs> you know, it's like, it, 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 and, and I just want to have it be a little bit more meaningful, a little bit more yeah. clear what it means. Um, and, and in our races, you know, right now, uh, you know, ha it's half of the number of signatures is the threshold. So if there's a vacancy and you get, you know, 30 votes, 26 votes, you, you know, you've got, you, you absolutely have locked in that, that party's designation on the general election ballot. And I think that's a huge part of why you have, you know, 60-ish uh, candidates in the last general election that were quote-unquote fusion candidates. And I think if you ask many of those, those candidates, do you really identify with the values, the platform? Do you associate with that party that's your second designation? I think a lot of them would say, you know, uh, I, you know, I, I've never voted for that party or rarely have. Um, and I think just a little bit of intentionality around asking for that consent form to be filed and then getting a slightly higher threshold of votes provides the increased integrity that I'm trying to get in for this piece of the bill. Representative Murphy. Uh, I appreciate what you're sharing. And I agree with that, and I would go a little further that uh, I think as a party, we expect a relationship, a mutual relationship, that we're not looking for a friends with benefits relationship, that uh, we want people showing up for more than just the election with your name on it or not making that 2 a.m. phone call from the bar on Saturday night. Um, <coughs> How are you getting your votes? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to push this metaphor too far. Right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm enjoying it, um, so let him rest. Yeah. I want to commit to the party if we're going to, and I want it to be mutual. And uh, I think this is where it's going. That we, we want people to step up. We have an open tent. You know, I, I can say that uh, I think there's a pretty wide spectrum of thought that you're going to get in the Democratic Party, and that's fine with me. But uh, uh, the people who, who make the commitment to the party are welcome. And the people who just show up once in a while or when it's convenient, I, I, don't, I don't appreciate it. Clarify. I, I think what I'm hearing is uh, an ask for party registration kind of direction. Is that I'm not what you're saying that? But I don't think you need to go that far to expect a, a mutual, mutually beneficial relationship. And I think what I'm trying to do with my compromise proposal is to hold open for people who truly have multiple party affiliations, are supported by people who vote, that there's that it's it's a, a higher, more meaningful threshold is what I'm putting on the table. So um, what I'd like to do with the 10 minutes we have before lunch um, is to walk through um, the actual words on the page just so we can get as far as we can with the bill itself. Um, we are going to take uh, more testimony on this bill. And I also um, wanted to, um, I would really like to uh, try to uh, get Carol Dawes um, feedback about the electronic ballot returns. So if floor is gonna be short today, very short, I, I might um, say we come back after the floor briefly and um, and pick this back up. So, uh, Representative Hooper and, and Representative Waters Evans? No, I was scratching. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to be. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. What's, your, what's your question? Um, I think it would be terrific if we could get an independent in here. And I actually, if I could have my pick, it would be Laura Sevilla. You can get in right here, too. 
So she has asked to testify, and I uh, have, am I am not barring members, but it's okay. it's it's very touchy having members of the body come and sit in a witness seat. So uh, I'm, I'm open to that if there's a pers if there's a specific perspective. You know, uh, John Rogers was here this morning, right, right. for instance. But he's um, not independent. Well, he I think he's a former, so he's a former member. member. He's not a sitting member. Right. Yeah, yeah, so so sit having sitting members testify John, John. is tricky. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm open to that, and I want to I want to have voices, but they they have other ways to tell us. Sitting members have a lot of opportunity to tell us what they think about a bill without being uh, sitting in the witness seat. Yes, so then, can we find an independent who's not a sitting member? Because I, I'm yeah. not seeing in this new version where it really addresses much about independent candidates, unless I've missed something. The only we haven't changed anything about what I had originally proposed, which is that independents file in a at the same time that major party candidates file. Um, and the reason we haven't talked much about independent candidates is the the major party primaries are their own, there are three separate elections that are happening at the same time. And so if you're running as an independent, you're not trying to get a major party designation, you are an independent. So all of this stuff comes down to us talking about the, the relationship between the parties and the state and the Secretary of State's uh, direction to the Secretary of State about how to administer those major party primaries. Um, so if you're an independent, it, that, those parts aren't really relevant to you. The only change I made from current law in my original proposal, and it hasn't changed in this draft, um, and unless there's some piece of this uh, Tim or Will that um, has some tangential impact on it, but it was just to move it up so that everybody files at the same time. And I think that's a major policy change, or a major change for candidates who would like to be independent candidates, and I think it's eliminating some people who may decide later to run um, and run as independents. And I'm not saying they're sore losers because maybe they weren't going to run anyway. Um, I'm just kind of thinking about my own situation and the election that happened prior to me getting appointed. And I think had I really, had I known the candidates who would have run, um, which I couldn't have known if I had the same filing deadline as them, if I were an independent, this is all if, I probably um, would not have known, but maybe would have put my name in after the primary, knowing who won the primary. And this is, this is very convoluted. I understand a lot of people probably wouldn't understand it, but the person who ended up winning ended up not taking their seat. Um, and that's how I got appointed. Um, so had I known that that person would have won the primary, I may be, if I were so inclined to have um, thought about it really hard, thought, well, you know, this is a chance to jump in as an independent, for instance. So I don't want to take that away from people, um, but I just wanted to bring that up because we hadn't talked about that today, and we kind of skimmed over that section. Representative Chase. Thank you. Uh, it, I hear what you're saying. I, I think, um, at least in my mind, I picture independent candidates as an intentional candidate who has decided they want to run to represent their people. They just don't feel like the parties. Uh, align with what they're wanting to accomplish. And I think what you're describing, at least in my mind, um, it would use the path of the write-in uh, candidate. So anybody can uh, do the write-in uh, to the Friday before the Friday or whatever, mm -hmm. for the general uh, file their consent. And that's their, uh, you know, I just decided at the last minute I want to run. Here's that path to do it. And uh, I. Um, at least the independents that I know are much more intentional about their uh, their choice to run. Yeah, I appreciate that, and I didn't mean for it to sound like it would be a last minute thing. It was just a really odd situation that um, <coughs> I, I, hard to describe. I hear you. Um, but 
But I also think some of the, the scenario that you mentioned, Representative Hango, it seems that the filling of a vacancy process and the appointment process that we have when, you know, if somebody wins and then they decide not to actually seek the office, that there are other remedies than allowing folks after the primary to file as independents. Uh, I actually am, you know, and I'm very obviously putting this on the, on the table here, um, from the original draft of this bit of this bill language, I really think that people who want to run for office should, you know, declare that they are running for office, and, and if they are running in a primary or running as an independent, you know, that it should just be one system. The idea that we kind of can like wait and see who the candidates are and then jump into an election, you could do that as a writing candidate, but I just think that people who are intentionally, you know, they've decided they want to seek an office. They're thoughtful about it, that they should, everybody should kind of pick a lane and get in there. Um, and that's been my belief from the beginning of this process. And then in, in hearing all of the testimony and all the thoughts and the hallway conversations and people calling me up and emailing me, you know, I've, I've put um, this compromise proposal around the, the multi-party nominations process on the table. And um, we'll, have, we'll have some time to think about it. Um, so, uh, I don't know if Tim is available this afternoon, um, but it, but if um, we could get this back up um, either at the end of our um, the CCB testimony that we're going to hear this afternoon, um, or when we get back from the floor, because I think floor is going to be really short. I don't want to keep people super long today, but um, I would love to at least get through the language by the end of the day, and then um, we've got more on this scheduled on this tomorrow afternoon. Do we, do we need two hours on the CCB one? Uh, there's a lot there, and we may. So, <laughs> um, yes. so, yeah, so I think um, we'll, we'll, if there, are there any, uh, before we break for lunch, are there any pressing, burning things folks want to put on the table Just first? Just to clarify, you're, Hank, you were talking about Josh Aldrich, is that correct? I don't want to mention people's names. Can I read for office? office? You can't say his name on the record. I don't know. I, and I'm, I'm also not necessarily talking about myself. I'm talking about other people who may have wanted to jump in. Okay, so that's well. the answer to my question. Yeah. The only thing I guess I would like to say, uh, Mr. Chair, is uh, in, in regards to Representative Hango's uh, importance of listening to somebody who's an independent. Mm -hmm. You know, we've heard from the Progressive Party, the Republican Party, uh, the Democratic Party. The independents don't have that party apparatus mm -hmm. and uh, for you to say that you know well we can we they're in the building we're going to hear from them you know we're going to hear from them on the floor of the house and when it gets that far it's pretty much a done deal um, so I that's why I think it's important to so I don't want to silence any voices so we will hear from at least an independent candidate before we take a vote on this bill I will commit to doing that I hear that loud and clear. thank you thank you Representative Byron Okay, so my comment is actually more for legislative council and it's structural, not policy, so shifty. Um, I saw some her hises in there and I believe we were structurally trying to get away from that. Uh, we applying a there. Um, <clears throat> we will update uh, that to strike any gender language. Cool. Just an observation. technical. Yeah, I think we're getting away from there too. It's mostly oh, the candidate the or candidate. the okay. official or Thank you. Sort of, yeah. And I think that was an existing statute, right? Representative Byron, it wasn't in the, the, the new pieces. Uh, there was a highlight on that one. Yeah, so that a lot of existing statutes was highlighted, highlighted for context. Okay, cool, yeah. cool. Yeah, that's uh, confusing. <laughs> yeah, it would just pop in my eye, right? I just wanted to say that one. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's a good point. Um, so great. Well, we will either pick this back up later this afternoon if we have time, uh, or we'll get back to it tomorrow. But I appreciate the really thoughtful conversation this morning. I know there's a lot here. and. Um, we will be back to it soon. So we'll adjourn for today and go off live and I'll see you all back at one.